me begin by asking, first of all, a very ignorant question, because I cannot read the script. What does it say behind me? <laughs> no, you tell me. What does, what does that say? Because I do not know. I see. Uh, can you read it? No, can, please, can you read it aloud? I would want to hear what that sounds like. I see. OK. All right. Yeah. Um, so thank you. I feel slightly um, perhaps unsure whenever I address audiences that I'm not used to, because I'm used to speaking to people in academic settings. And as I was telling my students earlier today, that the only other time that I have done something like this is when a former student of mine who was, uh, who he came to education late and he was retired and he um, or, he organized this talk, series of talks called the, the Good We Share on the idea of the common good. And it was over the period of Lent um, in Missenden, in Great Missenden, in a church. So now I feel like I have now spoken in a, in a church and today in, in a mosque. I want to, um, the, the topic of course that I want to speak about today is, is grim. And it feels especially heavy since um, on Fridays I teach my master's students and today for three and a half hours almost we were talking about the question of human rights and all the diverse perspectives from uh, around the world on whether and how do we think of human rights as being universal. So I don't see myself as some, you know, uh, providing some sort of a narrative to you. I'm very, I will of course make my remarks, but I want to hear from you and I want to be able to answer your questions and for us to have a conversation. Uh, the topic today that, uh, the, that I'm listed to speak on is Kashmir, Kashmiris and the human right and the question of human rights. And the reason Kashmir and Kashmiris are two words there is because very often when people talk about Kashmir, they don't talk about Kashmiris and the idea of Kashmir is seen as a place without people and certainly people's consent is not seen as part of that the larger story. Some of this has to do with the way in which democracy, the idea of democratic functioning and popular sovereignty are not always at ease with each other. Popular sovereignty has to do with the way in which um, consent of the people is important for an exercise of sovereignty. And um, we have seen ever more that even, uh, even in states or nation states to be precise, that, that lay claim to being a democracy in practice do not function through democratic means. Uh, it's a global story, but in, in the Kashmir context, and I don't know what level of knowledge or familiarity with Kashmir uh, to assume for this audience, but I'm, uh, has anyone from anyone in this room? Uh, does anyone in this room have roots in in Kashmir? Does anyone in this roots ha room have roots in Kashmir? To Kashmir uh, links to Kashmir. Okay, right. So um, not not a large number. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the larger, longer history of Kashmir? Yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, so I think then I can just summarize by saying that the long and complex history of the many regions of the erstwhile princely state of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, um, which people broadly refer to when they refer to Kashmir, is has has a long complex history which which has not seen uh, the kind of erasure of one identity. It's as if one. Uh, different religious and other social identities have, have coexisted with each other uh, for long periods of time. You have had different rulers in that region uh, who were Buddhist, who were Hindu, who were Afghan, who were Mughal, uh, up until the 19th century. And I think that's where it becomes an a problem of imperial boundary making. As you know, you all know, I'm sure, about the 1846 Treaty of Amritsar where Kashmiris, along with their land, the people and the land, was all uh, sold in the manner that used to happen at that time. But it's, um, you know that there was a certain amount of money that was part of that sale. But uh, it was also the fact that shawls and goats were also listed as part of that sale. So we have, uh, you know, the, 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 the way in which Kashmiris were, were bargained through the 19th century. And coming to the, the mid 20th century, the, the most fundamental thing is that Kashmir is a political dispute. And this is something that various parties are 
for reasons of ignorance, ill will or outli- outright malice, unable to recognize. Now, the question of human rights is has has of course always been a long standing issue for kashmiris because their human rights have not been respected of various kinds of kashmiris but in what happened on august the 5th 2019 again i'm guessing you do know about the revocation of the autonomy um you don't know <laughs> Well, you should ask uh, ask many more questions to me later then, because then I can just um, tell you a lot more detail. So um, the the Article 370 of the Indian Constitution um, was one of the articles that was put in as a temporary and special provision. And uh, there's, there's different levels of case to, there, there are different ways of making a case when, when you're challenging a decision, right? Stronger and weaker versions of that case. So uh, at even, even for those who, who, you know, who do not, did not have a problem with the revocation of the article itself, because the article had in, in uh, practice been diluted significantly over the decades between the uh, 50s and now, so the you know initially kashmir had a prime minister then it became a, a head of, a, a equivalent to a chief minister and and so on and so forth there were many other provisions that were diluted over a period of time but what even even to those who would not have a problem with that the manner in which it was done is completely indefensible which is to say that the consent of the kashmiris even in the 21st century was not taken into account the 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 legal reason that the state that the indian state gave was that um, they and this is uh, i'm not a, a lawyer i'm not a legal expert but i know legal experts who have written and spoken about it and the logic there is that well you needed to have the uh, the consent of the state legislature in order to bring about this change but because at that point the state legislature had been dissolved and there wasn't a legislature so the the union government arrogated to itself the 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 uh, basis for making that decision so not only were the people not consulted the legislature not being in in place also uh, means that there was absolutely no uh, in no yeah. no i guess no even fig leaf of of attempting to take consent of the people uh, and these are some of the bases in w- on which this, this is judicially this this you know people who have filed cases against it this is the the reason these are some of the reasons they would be making the the arguments they're making um i think it is okay wait i and that's where i think it links back to the project of uh, majoritarian hindutva nationalism in india right now right wing nationalism of that particular um form where the the kashmiris are not seen as people who are asking for their political rights or people who are asking for their human rights the kashmiris are viewed through the dominant communal prism that has that sees them as uh, religious beings before seeing them as political beings and uh, obviously the, as you know uh, in liberal in a you know as people who live in liberal democracies you would know that that's in itself fundamentally problematic because if you start to see people's claims as not being um as not being meritorious because they're human beings but as being less meritorious if they are say muslims or some other religion then that's in itself a problem and in this case the islamophobia which is uh, which is a key part of the hindutva project uh, and this is well documented and uh, you would all have come across some reference or the other to it especially in the last um, how many years has it been feels like forever but it's been 5 years this iteration of it since 2014 um that makes it problematic because then not only was the revocation done in this manner but then following on from it there has also been as you know this situation of a uh, a uh, a communications shutdown and a uh, siege like situation it's not the first time that this has happened uh, to the kashmiris there they have seen this happen in 2016 during the uprisings when pellet guns were used and previously but the but the way and the manner in which it is being done is of course accelerated and much more intensive compared to the past and to the extent that there is if a state wants to suspend certain rights or liberties that people have then they have to give some reason for it 
they have to say we are doing it because these are the legal reasons when i say they have to give some reasons for it the reasons don't have to be oh we're doing it to stop terrorists or we are doing it to stop the pakistanis that's not a, a legal reason in a court of law you have to give some reason of on some basis on proportionality on what are the legal reasons why it is justified for you to shut down communication and that in itself is is uh, it's reflected in the fact that the courts have not heard these petitions and this is again another problem and many international media including especially the economist have written about how the courts have been really slow and have not entertained any of these petitions that are there about people's you know about the state giving reasons because if you don't give the reasons if you don't have written orders so um, again um, all of the kashmiri leaders that have been detained or placed under house arrest there aren't in many cases there aren't written orders so if a petitioner goes to court on behalf of somebody and says that uh, you know that we this my my client has been placed in this situation then the courts on the one hand say well where's the proof yes you are showing us the newspaper reports but where's the proof and the reason there isn't proof is because very often there aren't the written orders there are verbal orders and and that's again something which is fundamentally anti democratic and um, and i think the um, the argument plus of course the internet so I, i again i don't know whether you know the initially everything was shut down and now it's the landlines and the uh, post paid mobile services that are op- operational but not uh, but for most people uh, not sms not prepaid and even those uh, media facilitation centers where people can go <laughs> journalists can go and access even they with the snowfall yesterday and and several other means not only is it it's it, not only is it is it um does it give media freedom and privacy but there are all these issues actually of access also um the international the international independent media human rights organizations and and uh, bodies like that are not have not been allowed entry indian opposition leaders have been turned back from the airport including not uh, we are not talking here of you know of very kind of um very radical leaders we are talking of mainstream political party leaders uh, who have been turned back from the airport and not allowed to go there uh, and th- whereas the government cites a law and order uh, and law and order prevention of terrorism prevention of loss of life argument in all of these cases in fact the the insecurities have increased so if you've been following the news you would also have read about uh the uh, the incidents of grenade attacks and and blasts that have led to the loss of life of migrant workers and these are muslim migrant workers from india in one of these cases so it's it's the and that and that loss of life increased insecurity and the suffering of kashmiris does and their uh, repression of human rights they doesn't make it too much of indian mainstream media where dissent is increasingly being um punished in one way or the other and this is a, a multifaceted story where you have people who are speaking for kashmiris in india and who face retribution you have people who are speaking against the majoritarian hindutva project who are facing retribution people who speak for media freedoms and others who are also facing retribution so it's part of a political project which cannot tolerate dissent and when and which does not care for people's rights and because kashmiris are both kashmiri kashmiris living in the valley are both kashmiris and also muslims that makes it a doubly problematic situation because they are seen as always already uh, suspicious in terms of their allegiance the the tragedy here is that not only are uh is that not is that this collective punishment means that even those kashmiris who have over the decade gone out on a limb to support indian positions in kashmir also find themselves treated in the same way like anyone else and this includes mainstream politicians uh leaders and others who have who are who have actually been very pro india and they have also been treated in the same way as any other people so therefore the fundamental problem the fundamental p- lens through which they are being perceived is that they are kashmiris and they are muslims and they are utterly alienated what this is doing uh, is like in many other radical contexts is that it's it's eliminating the gray zone it's creating the potential for much further violence which would be again in you know very harmful to the people you have to think about the fact that there are 
there is of course a generation of Kashmiris that has grown up with all of this being the norm whether they are Kashmiri Muslims there or Kashmiri Hindus who have been radicalized outside or Kashmiris in, in other parts of the world who have had to live with that loss. So and on top of that now if you think about the effect of this kind of communications shutdown on the economy it has it has you know the 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 losses are enormous for horticulture industry for perishable products fruits agricultural um produce for it sector for media for uh, tourism and hotel industry these are people's livelihood so there's apart from the apart from the overt physical violence and the militarization and the push towards extremism there's also this other uh, um, array of economic losses that people have been dealing with and then the psychological and um, and emotional trauma that both people there as well as their relatives outside or friends or other people outside who have been unable to communicate with them uh, or at least not communicate in, in any free sense because if you communicate with somebody in that situation and you ask them how things are, what are they going to be able to tell you? They, you know, uh, if they say anything that's not very, uh, you know, that's not palatable, then obviously their, their, you know, their conversations are not uh, likely not private. And, and there are reports that people have, that's what people say. They say that's fine. Now, the, the paradoxical and uh, again, another tragic thing is that people are being pushed to the situation where Kashmiris now, if they, if they shut everything down, then their life basically shuts down. Right. So they can't do anything at all if they don't open their shops, they don't go to schools, they don't, you know, they don't go to work. So then their whole life basically crumbles around them. And if they try to find spaces, so what they are doing is trying to negotiate the spaces of somehow living through all of this. But if they try to find spaces to live through all of this, then that is fed into the narrative of, look, they're so happy and everything is normal and everything is great. Um, the... Uh, states are not, I don't think any states are per se moral actors. People are moral actors and people make states, which is why people must hold states accountable. So because states are not moral actors, it is important for the people both within and outside of the region to understand that the claims on Kashmir that are in effect killing, subjugating, silencing and humiliating Kashmiris are not increasing security for anyone and that if the stated rationale is, well, Kashmir, it's, it's being done for the development of Kashmir. I can't remember the number of times I've said this since August. If it's being done for the benefit of Kashmiris, why can't Kashmiris say that themselves? Why can't Kashmiris be allowed to say that this is being done for our development? The other, um, the other uh, classic imperial strategy we know is one of divide and rule and, and projects of, of, uh, imperial power have always done that. The divide and rule in this case, obviously, you know that it's not just the autonomy that has be, um, been revoked, but um, um, but also that people, um, they, I mean, there's the revocation of autonomy, but there's also the bifurcation of territory. The bifurcation of territory makes uh, what was a state, the state of Jammu and Kashmir, which also included Ladakh, now into a union two union territories, where Jammu and Kashmir is one and Ladakh is the other. And the, the thing with the union territory is that without any consent, again, the demotion of status, as it were, from being a state to being a union territory means much less control and internal accountability. So in a union territory, the police is accountable to the home minister at the center and, and not to the state because it is not a state anymore. So Jammu and Kashmir have been kept together as a state, but Ladakh has been made into a, a separate state. So there's that, uh, you know, there's the politics of, of that divide. Um, then there's the uh, then there's the question of um, complicating the narrative that everyone in Ladakh is happy, which isn't the case because the situation in Kargil and the situation in Leh are are not the same. And then there is the other story that everyone in Jammu is happy, but certainly the reports uh, by Indian fact-finding teams that have gone there have revealed that um, there are people in Jammu, in universities, students. Who are, who are being othered as a result of this move, that there are transporters there whose businesses have completely suffered and who are not, are not happy and not supportive of, of this move. There are fears throughout the region of, of um, demographic and specifically of territorial, um, maybe territorial is not the right uh, word, demographic and, and change of land ownership. Because, uh, the you know, as the... Uh, I suppose the if Kashmiris are 
further um, made um, destitute as a result of all of these economic losses, then it becomes possible for other people to, from elsewhere, to acquire the land. Now, the acquiring the land for businesses was never a problem because it was even up until now, 99-year-old leases were possible to, to get. So, but permanent uh, acquiring of land, and this is something that goes to that question of the identity of a nation, that when the permanent acquiring of land there has the potential to change the, the demography, the economy, and the ecology of that region with little accountability. And these are... <clears throat> These are, of course, really severe concerns and Kashmiris have globally been trying to articulate them at every point. Um, the other rationales that are often put forward as a, as a way of justifying this move, apart from the development one, and the development one, as I said, is pretty simple. The, why aren't people allowed to say anything about it? And also, why should there be a choice between development and political rights? What kinds of regimes tell people either you can have development or you can have political rights? And what does that say about any ruling, uh, you know, um, any configuration of power that says you can have one or, or the other, but not both? So it, it betrays that that deep insecurity of a very toxic nationalist project. Um so there's, there's the development rationale. The other rationale, and this gets used all the time, not just in Kashmir, but globally over the years, uh, perhaps decades and centuries, is that it's being done to liberate the women some, somehow or the other. And this is a really, uh, you know, it's a really kind of, I think the politics of left and right is enacted uh, over the anywhere is enacted over this claim over women as if they are territory. The idea of women and property at some point becomes protection of women and property at some point becomes protection of women as property and, uh, uh, you know, and notions of honor and territoriality that get attached to it. And Kashmir then within that context gets seen as a very gendered uh, place. Uh, so here too, like in, in many wars that we have seen since end of Cold War onwards, you know, liberating the women, protecting the women kind of thing. So um, um, in, in the case of Kashmir, the argument is that this allows Kashmiri women the same rights as state subjects to be able to uh, inherit, prop uh, to, to not lose um, property rights. Um, that is challengeable in the case of, um, in 2002, uh, there was already a judgment, and I've said this in my congressional testimony as well. In 2002, there was already a judgment that Kashmiri women uh, will not will thank you will not lose rights to property, um, and and that they would be the, the same as men. Now that property cannot be inherited then to the women inherited then by the by the children of that woman, and that has to do with the way in which state subjects are defined. Now, obviously, that's not that's not entirely equitable. Perhaps people should be able to in, uh, inherit property, uh, even to the next generation, to to pass on that bequeath that property. But are but are Kashmiri women women and not Kashmiri? And do they can they be liberated as women while being suffocated as Kashmiris? That's that's clearly not the case. The other rationale that's given is that this is about uh, about making the life better for Dalits and landless people there. And that it's because they are not recognized as state subjects. They have not been recognized as state subjects till now. Can I just ask a question? Yeah, sure. Please. You've only mentioned Article 370 once. Yeah. But this was very instrumental mm -hmm. in what has happened in Kashmir. I'm talking about the rationales which were given for why Article 370 was revoked and why those rationales are problematic. So I'm saying that Article 370, the rationale given for it, it was being done for development. 370 was never approved by Congress in India. Is that correct? 370 was part of the Indian Constitution. Its revocation is, there are several rationales that are given for why that revocation makes sense. And I'm saying none of those na rationales bear scrutiny. So if you say that the rationale is that it's going to provide development. That doesn't work, and I've just finished saying why that doesn't work. The second rationale is that it's being done for the welfare of women. So I'm saying it's not, that is also legally problematic. The third rationale that's given is that it's to make people who are uh, landless be able to gain land by not by them not being dis, uh, disadvantaged by not being state subjects. Again, Kashmir is one of the states, the, the counter-argument to this is... Uh, you have not shed any light to the 
public what the article 2.2 is. Article That's right. 8. That is very yeah. crucial. Yeah. That is a yeah. crucial yeah. point. Yeah. Excuse, yeah. Me. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. 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 Just follow some order. At this place, we have a lecture, and then we have a question. Yeah. Yes, I would. I think that I think that because. Because right, see, so uh, so how this would be most productive? How this would be most productive? Because I don't know the questions inside your head or how you want this talk to be. So I give the talk the way I want it to, and then you ask me questions and I respond to it. All right. So uh, the third rationale that is given is that this is about ensuring greater access for people who are uh, who don't who haven't had land because they've been disadvantaged by not being state subjects. Now in that case. In Kashmir was one of the rare places to actually have had land reforms way back in the 1950s. So in 1952, land reforms were carried out in Kashmir, and the proportion of landless people in Kashmir, the landless Dalits in Kashmir, is 20-something percent, whereas the proportion of landless people in numerous other states, ranging from Tamil Nadu to Bihar, is way up like 60 plus percent in, in almost all of these cases. So the rationale that somehow the revocation of this article is being done for the welfare of these people, well, why, isn't, why, is, why aren't those kinds of things being focused upon in places where landlessness is maybe four times more? So that rationale doesn't work. The other rationale, the last rationale that's given, and sometimes that's perhaps more oriented towards a Western audience, is that it's being done to uh, it's being done to further LGBTQ rights. Now, again, on that situation too, if you look at the judgments of the case, and several former judges of the Jammu and Kashmir High Court have gone on record to say that the decriminalization of homosexuality in India, all those judgments also would have applied in the case of Kashmir. So legally, none of the rationales that have been given, whether it's development or uh, rights or uh, women's issues or land, do not hold up to scrutiny. So therefore, the, the, because there is no rationale that can be proven for why this was done, which is why the population is not being allowed to say anything about it. Because if you allow these debates to happen in the media, if you allow people to say how all of these rationales don't hold up to scrutiny, then you cannot create the echo chamber within which everyone just repeats, yes, well, see, we are doing it for the women, we are doing it for the landless, we are doing it for the Gujars or whoever, or we are doing it for anti-terrorism. And anti-terrorism is, of course, the easiest one to counter because actually this has made everyone much, much more insecure. So the... So in constitutional legal terms, even even on the basis of the state's rationale, it does not bear up to scrutiny. And that's why it is important that the courts hear these cases, and which is also why the courts have been especially slow and not have, have prioritized any of these cases. So that's that's the legal part. The other wider political and human rights part has to do as, you know, as part of this story, is that people have no access. So if there are differing narratives, who, who, who has actually been there? All, all of the Indian teams that have gone there of activists have said people are suffering and they've documented how people are suffering. But those people are labeled as anti-national, so their reports and their views are not taken seriously. The other set of people who have gone there have been the 24 European uh, generally far-right MEPs who were taken there in a, in, a, in a very farcical and problematic gesture and it became quite clearly apparent that even the people who had the external affairs ministry said, we have nothing to do with it. So that, that whole thing was, was quite shady and unraveled very soon. And then the EU also put out a statement saying this was not an official team. And since then, uh, Finland, which holds the presidency of the European Council, the fin Finnish foreign minister has explicitly said, well, you know, that those weren't the people to, to have said or to have known anything about Kashmir. So taking them there serves no purpose and the and so the so the point to take away from all of that is that this has been done in a very cloak and dagger surreptitious overnight kind of a way without any regard for constitutional procedure or consent of the people or for allowing any dissent to be expressed and it is and it has following on from that again the kashmiri people are resilient they've you know the, they've borne many miseries but this has this extended period through uh, during which all of them have been silenced is is also potentially a very 
dangerous template i mean living in a modern society not only if you can think that i'm sure all of you or almost all of you will have a mobile phone in your in your pocket right you will you we, we need technology to be able to communicate to be able to live to consult doctors to call for emergency help to for education for schools for filling forms for banks so by by depriving the population of a whole set of those rights or access to those rights it is in itself an uh, uh, a completely indefensible sensible violation of human rights and uh, and that's that's again why the courts have not heard it so um, i think that maybe because people i imagine in the room have a lot of questions maybe this is where i'll stop and let you ask me things and now i can address whatever you want me to address so ask me we now have some time for some question and answers Please. are there any questions from the ladies side anyone in the room who has any questions or it can be like say something more about X Y Z, like anything. Yes, um, he has a mic. <laughs> um, the Prime Minister of UK, uh, when he was asked to um, uh, respond to what is happening in Kashmir, he said this is nothing to do with the UK. It's to do with the uh, problem between. Uh, this should be resolved between Pakistan and India. So, what's your response to that? Yeah, n I actually, you know, I have written about it and screenshotted his remarks and underlined them and shared them on Twitter saying exactly how I feel. This is, it's the same line that Cameron took in 2010 during the protests when the young people were being killed. That, you know, we created the problem, therefore we've got nothing to do with it, which is a, which is eminently challengeable on, on every count. Like, why, why does that, it allows... Uh, an entity to first be part of a problem and then to absolve itself and say now it's not now it's not our problem well if 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 you were so central to the creation of boundaries in that part of the world to the way in which borders came about the very problematic way in which the the you know especially like uh, places like kashmir really suffered from this um, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but um, if you read the literature on how partition was being settled and Mountbatten was obviously deeply involved in it, and he had to go there and get this line sorted between India and Pakistan. And he did it really quickly, and they wanted to do it really quickly because he had to come back for one of his training courses. So that gives you a sense of this is historically on record. He had to get back to England because he had a course to attend, so he was like, okay, let's get this done really quickly because I have to be away. So it betrays that it shows us the longer history of the struggle of how people have not always been seen as not only equal, but treated very unequally, which is why it's really important to resist that in the present. So I find that position to be deeply problematic, uh, that Boris Johnson position, and I've said that. I think the international community especially has a role because we cannot just rely upon this fact as somehow being resolved because it's not in the interests of the states around, uh, you know, around what one might call Kashmir, whether it's India, China, or Pakistan, or it's neither in the, we have, we see evidence of either a lack of will or a lack of um, interest or a combination of both uh, on, on these different sides, uh, combinations of lack of will and lack of interest. So it cannot be resolved unless and until people take it seriously as an issue that needs resolution. And uh, it's not intractable. If you think about Northern Ireland and the, the years of dialogue that led up to the Good Friday Agreement, it is always possible, but it needs that initiative and the creation of that demand and political will for those dial and, and the international community has, a, has definitely got a role. And, uh, and I think the UK's position on this, uh, as evidenced by Boris Johnson, is, is completely not you know, not justifiable. I think that the Labour Party's position on Kashmir, which has been different, is one of the reasons why there is so much diaspora mobilization, uh, you know, of uh, right-wing Hindutva diaspora mobilization in the UK to, to support the Tories. And I'm sure you have seen that report. Uh, Sunny Handel's article came out, I think, two days ago by saying how the diaspora is actually mobilizing in specific 48 or 49 seats to make labor lose. So this, indi this is in itself a, a cause for worry. And I think that, um, yes, I think it's, it's <laughs> the international community definitely has a role. Huh? Uh, the, I, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the, the business and trade links are important. 
and this is why i mean the importance of those links i'm i'm kind of hesitant to say because i don't think the you know that this kind of argument that the economic argument trumps the moral argument because ultimately when you uh, when you enable such regimes to come about whatever they may be saying at the start they eventually when they get into their their you know full blown mode when they've silenced all dissent then i don't think it's it's um, very beneficial economically either so i think it's a, it's a it's delusional to think that you can trade with uh you know that you will have economic benefit because uh, it's the strong uh what's it free market strong state paradox you can have a, 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 an economy that's uh, sorry a, a state that is powerful enough to enable lots of things is also powerful enough to shut them down when it's against its own interests so this idea that somehow we can go on ignoring all of this other stuff it's powerful but we have to challenge it because this is not um it's it's not in the interests of people here or people there but it's a, it's a rationale that that is used by people that you know this is for the for the economy and and trade links um and all of these issues are interconnected and i'm uh, maybe many other global solidarities also don't happen for the same reasons because people ally with other people uh, if you think about all the awards that modi has received including from muslim leaders in you know in west asia then it indicates the way in which this problematic uh, um way of perceiving uh human rights abuses as if they're secondary as if economies can run on something less than people because uh once a place becomes really divided and violence is on the uptake then uh, then people don't want to even invest there so it's it's lar- in the larger course of things it makes everything unstable Uh, even economically so it's it's not sustainable but unfortunately that's what's being used here and these interests of course are powerful uh, the the commercial interests yes i'm first of all i'm very sorry to have interrupted you earlier Don't worry. because the tra- tradition here as dr nizar said earlier on is to wait until lectures have completed and then to ask questions So please accept my apologies. Mm. So the reason I was asking about that was because many people are unaware of what 370 is and which was introduced uh in mid to to late um uh 20th century and it was not fully approved by Congress. Um could you please for the sake of the crowd here explain what 3370 was and what it attempted to do to tr- to try and bring peace to kashmir and then um why it was now the cause of what is happening in kashmir today please hmm. thank you so much don't worry about asking you know if i'm if i'm normally if i'm giving a lecture if i have a whiteboard behind me or around me and some pens then my lectures are almost always dialogical but here it's a different format so um th- that's um not an issue now with um 370 so the the thing is that on 14th and 15th of august 1947 when india and pakistan come into being kashmir is part of neither so actually on 14th august 1947 kashmir is kashmir that territory does not belong to either india or to pakistan its future is unsettled as it were when we move forward to october the there is this whole machination which comes about with an uh, with an invasion from from the pakistan side um which has again there's a there are different com- historical accounts of whether that was official unofficial but anyway the people use different terms for it uh that invasion prompts uh, and coupled with and this is again something that's not emphasized enough coupled with the tax revolts that were happening in punch at that time uh in against the ruler and this was obviously the dogra regime was a deeply problematic regime the uh, combined in that atmosphere where the ruler felt his authority threatened he appealed to the indian government for help and again there is another back story as to whether the troops actually arrived to help before the instrument was signed or not that's also a subject of long standing historical debate but anyway so the the narrative is that the instrument of accession was signed but on the newspapers even of that day which you can find online and i've certainly shared this image too it says kashmir accedes to india and underneath that it says plebiscite to be held soon so the accession was always conditional upon the fact that a plebiscite would be held 
and that people would be given a choice. Now, this was a position that obviously Nehru most explicitly took, which was that Kashmiris will have a right to decide their future and that nothing's going to be forced upon them. Uh, at that time, there are two other states, uh, princely states, Junagar and Hyderabad, who also have this situation that's not resolved. And in the case of in the case of Hyderabad, there is a use of force. There's again a lot of machination. Hyderabad becomes part of India. In the case of Junagar, a referendum is held in and uh, and that situation is resolved too. Kashmir, the situation becomes uh, does is, does not get resolved because the wishes of the ruler and the wishes of the public are not neatly aligned, and. The And because when the Indian army reaches there and there is a counter-offensive against the invaders, they are driven back to a point which today we recognize as the line of control, at which point India takes the case to UN and applies for UN mediation. Now, the... The, so that was sort of what the main, like what Congress was doing at that point in India, which was the party and Nehru was the prime minister. But the right-wing position on all of this is that actually Nehru is the source of the problem. Article 370 is the source of the problem. They sh India should never have taken the dispute to the UN and they should have just driven these people all the way back and just claimed all of that territory. That's, that's the Indian right-wing position on this. So they blame this is why their hatred for Nehru is so deep-rooted because they feel like Nehru somehow was acting upon some principles. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, so there's that. Then the other part of the story is what's happening in Kashmir prior even to 47. What's happening in Kashmir is the rise of Sheikh Abdullah, who was the national conference leader. Uh, but national conference, before it was national conference, was Muslim conference. And so the Kashmiri nationalism, the indigenous Kashmiri nationalism, which was uh, not neither Indian or Pakistani, that indigenous Kashmiri nationalism goes through various phases at that point and accompanied by very violent instances, such as in July 1931, when there was a massacre of several people, uh, 13 July 1931, if I'm not mistaken and then also in 1944 there's the Naya Kashmir manifesto so there's a there's a whole kind of separate history of indigenous Kashmiri nationalism that's also unfolding at this point when India and Pakistan have not even been created then when these two entries get created there is this UN thing and then the UN for the first few years up until the 50s uh, in, it's one of the biggest involvements, the first important interstate involvement that the UN is deeply involved in. It sends various missions trying to find out how can we demilitarize, how can we actually hold this uh, this plebiscite. But the positions, the positions of both Indians and Pakistanis change, and there isn't a um, a proper enough under. I mean, the people who've studied those UN reports, missions of those repo uh, reports of those missions, say that there wasn't enough of an understanding on where India and Pakistan fundamentally disagreed in any of in and then add to which there was this complicated equation between Nehru Sheikh Abdullah and um, what's his name the king the Dogra king um, what's his name Sunny Hari Singh Hari Singh Karan Singh's father yes so uh, no Hari yeah Hari Singh yeah, yeah Hari Singh so there's I think, yeah, because if you read the correspondence and actually this is published the correspondence between the king and then his son uh, Karan Singh, his son, um, who later takes up the correspondence from his father between them and Nehru, you see that their perspective is obviously completely different because, you know, some of the, the RS, the Hindutva RSS project was always to claim all of Kashmir. And another important part of this story is the 1947 Jammu massacre. So in partition, when when people were moving across, in the the Jammu's transformation into a in, into a uh, Muslim minority region was was because of this violence in uh, in in the massacre there, and that is often forgotten. So there are you know there are selective tellings of that history. Then um, in 1953, basically, so 1952, the Delhi Accord gets signed. Nehru Sheikh Abdullah friendship kind of falls out, and in 1953, Sheikh Abdullah is unceremoniously deposed. And again, in the way in which the right wing doesn't forget Nehru, uh, forgive Nehru. Kashmiris do not forgive, forgive Sheikh Abdullah because Kashmiris feel that Sheikh Abdullah betrayed them by actually, you know, believing in India and going with Nehru and all of that. So in 1953, he's just unceremoniously removed from power and uh, Ghulam Muhammad Bakshi is put in place. So then this tragedy continues through various things happening where uh, Kashmiri, uh, so Kashmiris, the reason that article was there to go back to what the gentleman asked is because Kashmiris had their own autonomy except for defense, foreign affairs and telecommunications. 
uh, all of the other things were and there was this idea of state subjects kashmir even had its flag which was officially there until the 30 31st of october 2019 until a few days ago so there was even a flag there was in practice the autonomy had been eroded but in theory there was that autonomy so outsiders could not buy land in in kashmir and all of that has just been uh, you know unilaterally without any consent uh it's it's taken just that whole story that story to a whole new level so between the 50s and the 80s you have various puppet sort of regimes or compliant regimes because whenever somebody comes in power that the center doesn't like they just find a way of getting rid of those people they just impose governor's rule which happens various times and then come forward to the 80s when all of the things that are leading up to the cold war and the elections in 1987 the um which were believed to have been rigged in those elections because the muslim united front was going to come to power that plus pakistani sponsored terrorism in that late 80s period led to this armed insurgency now within the context of an armed insurgency minorities and kashmiri hindus in this context were targeted were assassinated because they were minorities and also because they were usually working for the states like they were they had held important positions at least in the in the cities in the rural areas not so much so the minority exodus happens the kashmiri pandits who are targeted and assassinated leave uh, jagmohan is the governor jagmohan was an rss guy and there has never been proper investigation of all of the massacres of kashmiri hindus muslim sikhs nobody like that's the thing emergency powers at that point were imposed uh, armed forces special powers act public safety act and all of that which under which no no uh, prosecutions have happened no convictions have happened like there's and and we have like a whole range of things that range from you know deaths to enforced disappearances to uh, kunan pushpara type mass rapes to other instances of violence and there's there's an absolute lack of accountability and justice because in order for people to be delivered that you first have to recognize that all of this happened and that there were these problems and that i mean who has the time to speak for that long on republic tv or whatever it is like you get 2 minutes and you say you're pakistani <laughs> if you're if you don't agree with me you're anti national you're pakistani you're jihadi you're western sponsored you're whatever so there's no you know there's no logical way of of telling people that look actually it's not a more just read the history it's all there mm okay and then maybe her yeah just want to uh, put some light on the historical backgrounds you because you are continuously speaking so i just want to support you thank you i'm going to have uh, to turn now and it's a myth and it's a very wrong historically that accession was done on 26th of october by maharaja okay. maharaja hari singh was traveling from srinagar to jammu by road he reached jammu 11 o'clock and from indian side nobody came so it's first of all the base is on lies 26th of october 1940 summit never happened and next day when indian army reached to the srinagar airport and they were shocked to see patiala regiments of indian army were already guarding srinagar airport so the conclusion by alister lamb the british historian says that it was a it was preplanned by nehru and the the mount batten as you said that he was in hurry because you know that his advena and nehru story you know the very close so they were sometimes asking i interviewed the 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 daughter of uh, advest lord mountbatten she said the mid of the night our father was shouting and our mom why don't want to see you with nehru again because she was telling all the secrets of british to the nehru then the number 2 of the jammu massacre because in europe we say that you know if you talk about against the holocaust it's a crime but in kashmir as you said in jammu official data is to 200,050 lakh muslims were massacred but unofficially it is 5 lakhs 500,000 muslims were massacred in jammu and 17,000 muslim women were taken kidnapped and still they were not you know and that's the case where the tribesmen came because there was a muslim so when they were raping and i know there's a massacre of children everywhere in punch rajouri and jammu they were asked to we will take you to pakistan and in that family my mom's cousins were also there children they said okay you sit here and we will take you to pakistan and it was colonel kripa the colonel of 
Maharaja, who then ordered Denver Patiala Regiment's Hindu army all, surrounded and they killed, they massacred them. So that's one of the things. So that was that was mm -hmm. my right. additional thing. So uh, as in uh, you know uh, there are there are various accounts of it. Um, I know that Victoria Schofield has written, has been to various regions. I mean there are ev ev you know every narrative has their favorite historians. So there are historians that India will cite, historians that Kashmiris will cite, historians that Pakistan uh, Pakistanis will cite or. or people, not maybe Pakistanis or Indians, but people in sympathy with their state views. So around instrument of accession and its signing, there is a controversy. Um, but I think that um, the point for, for me is not, uh, I, I, anecdotal, anecdotal um, evidence and family traditions and oral traditions and oral histories are all really important. And I feel like um, it, it would be so much more helpful if there were spaces where people could talk about their versions of what they have, the stories that they have inherited. Because uh, speaking as an academic, I have heard people on every side say, you know, these hundreds of thousands of people and these things that happen. Now, as un unless one has verifiable historical evidence, which I'm sure exists, but the only way in which you can build the most complete account is to look at all perspectives and then put together okay what's what is the evidence for this historical claim so uh, and and all of these massacres I think any and all killings are a problem and the the biggest problem is the lack of knowledge and the lack of uh, accountability and 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 you know judicial remedies for these things or even cases or reports where people actually know about what's happening and what has happened in the longer run of history in 47 in 48 in uh, you know in um, in 89, in 91, in 90, in 2002, like all of these years for Kashmiris, it's, uh, or, and more recently, 2010, 16, uh, 14, there's every year there's something or the other happening. And it's as if like the next bigger tragedy makes the previous tragedy somehow, you know, instrumentalizable for something else. And, and that's, that's really, uh, you know, that's, I mean, I don't know, I wasn't there. But uh, I have, but you've, you've just provided one version. I've also heard of, and there are reports, of the tribesmen on their way also rooting, pillaging, raping. And that's also historical fact. So unless we look at the accounts of historians, so I mentioned Victoria Schofield, the other person would be Andrew Whitehead, who's a historian of that period. So if you read Andrew Whitehead's uh, account, and he's, he's got a lot of stuff yeah. online as yeah. well, including original documents from that period, then, then you can have a more... Just about, about Kashmiri Pandits who said, you know, I was working on television, Doordarshan Kendra, for 20 years. Many of Kashmiri friends, we used to sit together, eat together, you know, there was no sort of, you know, any hatred. And I also, when there was the longest curfew of 80 days, with my own eyes, I have seen dead bodies coming from the graveyard army, didn't allow them to bury. In one, you, apart from the Mirakadal, if you go on that side, one woman was crying that there are 17 dead bodies in the mosque and army is not allowing. Other man was crying that his wife and children, six are dead bodies inside the Indian army is not alarming. We went to, for the curfew pass to Jagmon. I met to the Jagmon. Then the Farooq Abdullah's cousin, Nidu Freedi, was my class fellow. He told me the, all the story that what happened, some of the, you know, all, every Muslim or every party is not bad, but some of the pundits who were working for the government, and some of them, they wrote to the Chitan newspaper in Kashmir that Muslim brothers, we are sorry, we let you at your own and our own Hindu brothers are looking bad on our women. And they, they said the governor, we will be giving, give you most money and monthly salaries. They were placed in Delhi and one embassies to tell them that Muslims are killing Hindus. Actually, you know, there's Chati Singh Pura. 36 Sikhs were killed and then when the Clinton came, and the Clinton came and Clinton wrote right in his book that it was because of me, if I would have not been gone to India, the six had not been killed. They were killed by Rashtra Rifles, Rashtra Rifles Indian Army. And the, mostly the pundits today, they, some families in uh, uh, what's called the Kulgam and other sides, they didn't go. And they were buried by the Muslims. There was no hatred. But because of the, some sort of uh, agencies, you know, they created hatred between Hindus and Muslims. The, I mean, I think that the inter, the breakdown of the, it was never perfect. There's always class, there's always caste, there's always regional identity, and those cleavages were always there. But the fundamental, uh, you know, kind of breaking apart of Kashmiri identity is perhaps the longest kind of evident 
casualties, the intercommunal harmony having totally gone. Because, um, uh, you know, Kashmiri Hindus and Kashmiri Muslims, and I, I know this from, you know, from, again, from the, you know, personal but also other experiences, it's not, there is a regional Kashmiri identity, at least if we speak, speak of the valley. And that identity for the longest period of time meant that Kashmiri Hindus were not exactly like Hindus and Kashmiri Muslims were not exactly like other Muslims. The reason for that was because it was a syncretic zone. There was this whole kind of historical, just look at that region. I mean, it was this so important in a pattern of trans Himalayan trade. It was a zone where people met each other and there were, there were of course, separate identities, but there were also common shared, this kind of hatred that we have seen, the complete division where people can only either talk of Kashmiri Pandits or only either talk of Kashmiri Muslims is a you know, 30, what, 80, how long it has been, 40-year-old thing. It has just become so much more, it's uh, almost impossible to talk about both of these people in the same um, uh, um, argument. And I think it's a bit like, you know, when during the Holocaust, when the Germans and Jews who were previously living next to each other, suddenly the society becomes so, the ideology of anti-Semitism becomes so powerful that suddenly the person that who your children were playing with and whatever then becomes this absolute other and the people can come and take them away and you won't care. And that has literally happened to Kashmiri. So on the one hand, I keep hearing endless uh, accounts of people saying, you know, there were these things, these posters, these uh, slogans on loudspeakers saying, Ralev Chalev Galev, that's all. And on the other hand, I hear about these other, uh, you know, the, the continuing tragedy of the people who live there. It's, it's just as if you cannot talk about both these things. And I think that just as you, the memories you're talking about, and I've heard other, other people talk about, you know, losing their home or losing friendships, uh, um, seeing their friends die or cross the border or get killed or be shot or, you know, people who, who study mass graves, all of that. It's all part of that same story. And I think the hardest thing for us as human beings is to be able to see them as part of that same story. And that's, that's of course, also least politically profitable. Uh, because conflict and, uh, and misery is a very profitable thing. A lot of people, <laughs> you know, survive, a lot of survival um, depends on that. And as, uh, as a person once said, uh, it's very hard to get someone to uh, understand something if his salary depends on his not understanding it. And, and it's, it's really the case that you have to get, there are entrenched interests that of, you know, bureaucracies, militaries, local politicians, center politicians that become so entrenched. But the people who are suffering at the sharpest end of it all is the ordinary Kashmiri guy on the street who has a choice between being humiliated, suffering, seeing humiliation of others, um, struggling, escaping, or trying to do something there and, and barely succeeding, or trying to take a, a revolutionary kind of path, knowing he's going to be killed. And none of those choices are anything that any young person ought to have or any person ought to have. But those are the choices of those people. And whatever they do, whatever path they choose, they never get over the guilt or the pain. Because one way or the other, they're, they're betraying their people, or they're betraying their family, or they're betraying their values or something. It's just endless tragedy. Um, the, person there, and then the person there, and then the person there. Uh, you must have heard Imran Khan's speech on this issue. I actually haven't, and that's because I was very busy on the day. And since then, everyone, you know, there are these trolls who keep saying, have you plagiarized Imran Khan? And I'm like, I'm an academic. I don't plagiarize. Now I don't even want to hear it because, no, no, <laughs> because he, I'm speaking. No, he has me uh, tackled, apart from the mm -hmm. problem in Kashmir, he also t uh, tackled the problem in Kashmir. And he rightly mentioned that the way you are treating Kashmir at present, you think you're, they're going to sit quietly and do nothing because the atrocity you are doing at present. It's not going to tolerate by the younger generation. And I think this was taken very badly by the Indian government, and she responded as well. I think it's worth listening to it. And the, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, yeah. This, this project of Hindutva, I mean, I have uh, the reason I get wherever I speak, I prefer myself to be audio, video, ideally video recorded, is because I have said everything on record. So in so if you Google in February of 2019, actually a very vitiated time because all of this confrontation was happening February this year. But the the you know, 
I had agreed to give that talk in in Islamabad at this conference, and it, the the videos are all online. So and and where I have spoken about the way in which that that Hindutva project is problematic. Uh, I I mean nobody is above board, but I think that at this very crucial point in history, we have to make some some gradations. Like we have to make so uh, Nehru was a very problematic figure, but is Nehru the same as uh, is Nehru the same as Modi? I would say not. Gandhi was a problematic figure, but is Gandhi the same as Godse? I would say definitely not. And I feel like right now, yeah, I feel like right now with this way in which a purist thing, like we just, we are just so going to be so right about everything, means that we have stopped, we have stopped being able to see, actually there are shades of, of you know, things going wrong. And at at that end of that, you have Trump and Modi and these figures who are who are who are you know not good for their populations or for any populations or for the planet. And I think that that at this point we have to be able to join up, think, and see like how do we promote humanity? The person. That A very simple question: Do you think this torture is ever going to stop? It's going on and on. It's exceeding. And none of the Sky programs of the Hindu channels I watch this a lot. Seven ten, seven or nine. They never talk about it. They never show it. They say Modi in the good way, like you said earlier. I mean, when is it torture? I mean, over here, human rights, you know, there are many Hindu MPs, many intellectual people. Mm -hmm. Even they are denying it, you know? So when, 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 how, how, do you think it's going to go on for another 12 months, two years, five years for it to stop or to calm down or how long? It's going on forever. It has, it has. It's the it's the longest running dispute um, in, in the region. If you, I mean, I think that there are many people, both in India and globally, who have this reflex idea that you know, which is kind of this two nation thing that India is a Hin you know. So what's wrong with India as a Hindu country? You know, the 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 ideology that sees you and I as not being. You know, we can be British, but we're not really Western yeah, in that yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. that sense, that purest thing and the, the, the person most famously associated with it is Huntington, Samuel Huntington, um, whose ideas became really powerful after 9-11. But his, uh, his article in the 1990s, 93, I think, was called Clash of Civilizations. And he felt like the world was just divided into these civilizations. And there was the, you know, there was there was the Christians, the Muslims, no, not the Christians, the Euro Europeans, the Muslims, the uh, Indic, and, and then he said maybe Africa has a civilization, he wasn't sure. So, uh, yeah, which is just like so revealing. But in that, so from that sort of paradigm, from that sort of idea, which is nonsensical as it is to to bring all these people into one and say okay this is all one civilization when 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 those ideas become powerful because they serve certain interests then you get to a point where they start to have a life of their own so in that context people would say yeah of course pakistan should be a muslim country and india should be a hindu country so this idea of of democratic institutions of of some versions of secularism of people having rights is becomes ever more a very radical idea i think anywhere to argue for today because people seem to be okay with retreating into yes us and them and in that context uh, if you look at something like kashmir it's it's never going to be i mean india and pakistan anyway signed the um, bilateral you know the shimla agreement and said it's a bilateral thing but but again, there's a problem because those, those conditions were, were have been on both sides not, not held true. So as India becomes more and more a Hindu country, there's, I mean, Imran Khan is great, okay? Like I've heard a lot of people say Imran Khan is great. I don't personally know him, so I don't know how he is. But I will not, I will not understand, I do not understand why in the Indian election campaign he explicitly came out and supported Modi. Like, why did he do that? I'm sorry. I'm willing to ask this on record. Like, is that you can you can not support anyone? That's fine. But why would you come out and say that somebody like this guy, who has this very problematic record, not just since 2014, but way back in Gujarat? So why would you support that? And I think that it's everyone's fall fallible. Maybe he made a mistake. That's fine. That's all right. But, but I'm saying that it needs better thinking to understand that India and Pakistan are not going to, at least the states, are not going to resolve this in the interests of the Kashmiris unless the international community and populations in India and Pakistan understand how the enduring conflict is not helping them but hurting them. And that's really fundamental. 
you know to get people in those places to understand because the you know the indians are not served by this kind of thing so it's not in the interests of the ordinary indian who goes and dies there as a soldier or as a migrant laborer or whatever or it's it's not in their interests or who might die from something else that will happen as a result of it so this is why the international community has a role and i think in understanding the aspirations of of people from all of those regions of that state and bringing together i think that anything is possible if there are dialogues which are which involve people who live there and who have the voices that have the credibility not not just not just people who lead states but may not have any you know you can you can have uh, trump and imran khan and modi sign a piece of paper but are people in on the ground in kashmir going to uh, agree by it abide by it N- not really because you have to build it from the people given the how long this has gone on and the tragedy is that those people's stories uh, now the media kind of globally is covering it a bit in the past even in 2016 it's just you know when when that whole summer of pellet blindings was happened was happening and finally after 3 months of all of this tragedy the international media kind of woke up to the fact that actually there is a mass blinding happening here and then what happens next india and pakistan go to war kashmiris are being fought over planes fly over their heads fall on them but kashmiris are not part of the story it's the indians it's the pakistanis it's a part it's a way in which insecure nationalist projects do not take into account the interests of the kashmiris and they won't until people see why that is a problem why that's and and this is why the solution cannot come from the uh, you know top it can come from many different sites of conversations that build up the call for the international community to to do something about it part of that is getting better leaders here as well by the way like in elections and in the us <laughs> uh the plebiscite i think uh, because the uh, the i think some country in a in a wish list if you had like a desiderata like a wish list uh, a country should move a motion at the un to get a third option added to the plebiscite which will not be vetoed by russia china or whoever or anyone else and that third option should be india pakistan or kashmiris of any region deciding to to be independent theoretically speaking and then people have a choice and they choose because if you ask the people on the ground anyone who's done that actually say uh, they want uh, azadi so it's you know it's a self determination movement and the self there needs to determine itself uh, from a status position which is either pro india or pro pakistani they'll say oh that's wishful thinking but yeah maybe the fall of the berlin wall was wishful thinking before it happened maybe end of slavery was wishful thinking before it happened maybe sometimes things do happen um but okay. we never know okay very Question. last question from ikbal uncle then we really need to finish uh, thank you very much uh, excuse me please observe the protocol um i have been noticing for the last few years that the indian courts including the supreme court is gradually moving towards the hindutva position and this is of concern because the supreme court was one of the things which was at the end of the day looked upon as somebody who can do something do you do you share that view yeah i actually tweeted an article about it just this morning and there has been it's not just the courts i think any any nationalist project anywhere and as is the case in this project in india that seeks to transform the nature of the state uh so the government and the state are two different things right the state is the enduring state and the governments are what come and go so the constitutional bodies and the separation of powers between in a, in any kind of democracy that wants to be seen as liberal the separation of powers between legislature executive and judiciary those who make the laws those who enact the laws and those who give judicial remedy has to be there has to be a separation of powers and what happens when there is state capture or moves to state capture is that constitutional bodies increasingly fear to act independently and this has been well noted in the uh, decisions of in the uh, not just always decisions but sometimes just not not hearing the case uh, of the supreme court and and uh, you will remember 2 years ago i think january 2017 four of the judges of the supreme court came out publicly and said that that there is a pro, you know there is a threat to democracy here so these are things that have been building up for a long time and in the article by samar harlankar and i have to say that i'm not the only one there are people in india too who are speaking up about these things at at huge risk to themselves uh, you know given uh, given the way in which this this political project is unfolding 
Um, so uh, that this um, in that article, he talks about the way in which people have been punished. You might know of Sanjeev Bhatt's case. He was an IPS officer. You will know about Kanan Gopinathan's case, who was an IS officer who quit in support of Kashmiris. Now, that's the kind of solidarity I think is really vital. This is not, it doesn't have to be your people for you to care about it. Because it's it's just wrong. Any injustice helps other injustices. So he's having a case being brought against him on premises like he they I mean they're really struggling to find reasons and one of the reasons they give is like he was late in applying for an award that he should have applied for, and therefore it's it's just or and in the case of Sanjeev Bhatt it's a, it's something that they have on him from late 80s and that's being instrumentalized right now so it's it's the courts and also the uh, one of the three election commissioners Ashok Lavasa I think who gave dissenting judgments in the in the cases uh, during the campaign this year and uh, during the elections this year and his dissenting judgments were not recorded and he's again listed in that story as another person so there's this kind of pursuit of a vindictive agenda which is what it says that you know there's a there's a silencing and i feel like kashmir assam uh, media constitutional bodies this this is a as i said at the congress this is a proto fascist trajectory it should scare anyone who cares for the country the region or or globally because these projects feed off each other they have these people are are know their friends a student of mine was telling me today that about this incident where in Trump comes into the Oval Office or somewhere and he calls out for an CC and he says now where's my favorite dictator you know like as if that's that's all right like that's there's uh, these these people know they have their they know their affinities they know who their friends are and uh, and it's a struggle of people against that kind of power just a food of thought would you like to take the lead because british are the one who sold us and sometimes they told me professor we created this mess and we have to solve it so if you just write a piece of paper with a personal british problem call it in international conference india pakistan and kashmiris in london to solve this problem i wish i had that kind of power <laughs> isn't it i mean uh, i wish i had that kind of power i don't think oh, that yes but 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 Boris Johnson, as we were talking about earlier, has already gone on record to say these things are not, you know, it's the, the, the challenge is not to lose hope, yet at the same time to keep doing things. Uh, maybe one, you know, maybe there'll be like two great leaders, coincidentally good leaders in a place and something will change. But until that happens, say if, you know, you have like a change of government in the US and in the UK and somewhere else, and you suddenly have like a move towards a better situation. But barring that, sudden change does not come about. The, the process is slow and gradual. And firstly, the, the consent has to be created. See, another really sad part of this story is that no imperialism or colonialism has ever functioned without people who've supported it. There's always a very small number of people who lead any imperial colonial venture, especially for colonial ventures, who are there. It's, it's the, no, what I mean is like the, the, you know, the British in India in terms of number, when looked at the number of Indians, was a very small number. So likewise, you have to also think about what makes it possible for people in Kashmir to not be able to see what's happening around them, which, which you know, which even people outside, including Indians or British or other people can see. So it's also about creating that basic understanding of consent. No regime can function without consent. The, you know, the voluntary obedience that we give to systems is the most powerful tool that we have. And if people have, you know, this is why civil disobedience, uh, including, I mean, there's even academic work um, uh, especially by a scholar called Erika Chenoweth that looks at long, you know, data over long periods and finds that in the modern world, nonviolent civil resistance has been one of the strongest and most powerful tools. Uh, so for nonviolent civil resistance, you need to first have people have that consent. I mean, if you have now the NCPDP see there, then, you know, all of them being placed on the same side and, uh, you know, and one thinks, okay, when the next kind of you know, people who, who are in support of this position, who happen to be Kashmiris, what's their ground going to be? So it's, it's also that. It's also like, how do we first have that? How do we first have that representation and understanding in Kashmir Valley and the dialogues with people there before the... Because otherwise, it's just very easy if people are divided. Okay, can we just take the one final question? Thank you.
Yes, yes. because I could just go yeah. on and yeah. then I'll just, <laughs> until I drop, which is not a good idea. Your, your speech at U.S. Congressional was excellent. What Thank impact you. did it make to the congressman? Did you manage <coughs> to uh, explain them? Was you satisfied yourself? Have they changed their mind about this conflict for the last 72 years been going on? So Thank I you. think, yeah, I think that whether, um, okay, different levels at which I can answer this. So these were people who are already interested in human rights and in foreign affairs. So that's why they were part of that committee. And if you see the whole session, you'll see that almost all of the Congress people who spoke, congressmen and women who spoke, were very critical of the kinds of things that were happening. So uh, there's there's that level where a state has to support a right to self-determination. That is obviously not, that's an official position that a congressperson cannot. But at the level of looking at and looking at these human rights violations as serious ones, that without a doubt, as you, if you look at the whole session, the four hour session, the morning and the evening one, in numerous people raised this concern in very strong terms, saying, why hasn't US Senator been allowed to go there? Why has Senator Van Hollen not been allowed to go there? Why can't our committees go there? Why doesn't media function in this way? So there was clearly, I think, an understanding in a way that hasn't perhaps at that level ever happened before. Uh, on the topic of Kashmir. So that is there. But then that's the Congress. And then there's the Senate. And then there are their own presidential primaries. So it's, you know, it's just that we live in such a mad world. When you think about Syria, like I was just saying to people today, it's years and years. So when you think about the fact that all of this is happening simultaneously, we and and you know and it's so tempting for people to see this as in some kind of a list which it should never be because these are all interlinked things in various ways through uh, you know through um, issues ranging from military industrial complex to interests of profit to alliances between um, far right uh, electorally legitimated fairly authoritarian leaders so there are these global linkages but i think that Tomorrow, uh, there, there isn't going to be something happening tomorrow because, of course, in the U.S., lobbying is legal. So I'm sure there are other lobbies. But I can assure you that when it comes to the question of facts and evidence, and if one is allowed to make that case, then there is no difficulty in making that case on Kashmir. The trouble is that many venues, you know, and say if you are appearing on a TV debate or something, there isn't that you can't make that case because... If there's no citation, right? So people can just say whatever lies they want. No, it's not like that. That's why we live in the era of fake news. No, we haven't turned off the internet. No, it's because of this. And then, uh, you know, this takes us back to the, the need for there to be amplification of voices that are not covered in mainstream media. Because the mainstream media has a has a you know state centric focus and they they do not cover these stories. In fact, some of that testimony was edited. As you, there was a A and I did a story on what I said at the Congress and they edited out the bit where I said proto fascist trajectory, and then News Laundry did a story, which is how I came to know of it. Then News Laundry did a story saying, well, they just edited parts of what she said, and it, it's just such basic level of propaganda. You would think now it would be more sophisticated. <laughs> this is this is like Cold War level of propaganda. Okay, Thank thanks. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha, for the excellent speech. Thank you. Salwat. 